Welcome to this session titled Introduction to Asset Liability Management. In this session, we'll review the relationship between financial performance and asset liability management and the role of ALM in your credit union. As a credit union, we are a financial go-between for our members by acting as a safekeeper for both their financial assets and obligations. Our shares are our members' assets. When our members save money and place it on deposit in our credit union, we are buying the money from our members by paying them a dividend rate. Members who need money ask for a loan. We facilitate this by lending out or selling money to qualified borrowers and charging an interest rate, hopefully at a higher rate than we're paying members who deposit with us. Deposits not loaned out may be invested in securities or other banks or credit union certificates. At its very core, ALM is managing these assets and liabilities for the benefit of our members. In serving as the financial go-between, there are risks that we must manage. The primary risks for the credit union include credit risk, interest rate risk, and liquidity risk. While these risks are important, the credit union also has to manage other business-related risks, such as operational risk, legal risk, and reputational risk. Taking on and managing risks is fundamental to the credit union business. While you may not be involved with day-to-day -day management, you will be involved with the strategic direction of the credit union. Therefore, you will adopt policies that establish the framework of the business the credit union undertakes. You will establish risk limits, read reports presented at board meetings, and know the credit union's financial condition and the risks it is undertaking. Financial statements are the formal record summarizing activities of the credit union. Think of it as a financial report card. We can all probably relate to financial statements on a personal level. If you have ever completed a loan application, you have submitted your financial statement. The assets you listed on the loan application would include your house, car, and retirement funds. Liabilities include your mortgage and car loans. The final section of the balance sheet is the net worth or capital. An easy example of this is if you sold your house and car, converted retirement funds to cash, and paid off your mortgage and car loans, the net worth would be the funds that remain. A credit union's balance sheet is similar to your own personal financial statements. The income statement displays revenue generated from sales and subtracts expenses associated with generating revenue to arrive at net income. In addition to financial statements, we will be looking at several ratios which help explain the relationship between the credit union's balance sheet and income statement. These ratios give you the ability to compare your financial performance with other credit unions, regardless of asset size. This is a sample summary level balance sheet and income statement presented in a format to show the relationship between the two and it introduces the concept of asset liability management. A credit union's primary source of income is net interest income, which is the interest income generated on loans and investments, less interest expense, known as dividends, paid on shares. The level of net interest income is a function of the types of assets and liabilities held, the concentration or mix of these assets, and the rate earned on assets or paid on shares. In this sample balance sheet, the credit union has total assets of 153 million. Investments of 44 million and loans of 93 million both generate interest income. However, they generate different levels of income. Investments generate 264,000, which is a yield of 0.60%. This means that for every $100 of investments owned, the credit union is earning 60 cents. Compare this to the loans, which generate $6.6 million at a yield of 7.15%. Not only does this credit union have a higher concentration or mix of loans of $93 million compared to $44 million, but the rate earned on these loans is also higher at 7.15% compared to 0.60%. In order to make these loans and purchase the investments, the credit union must have funding. Funding is provided by members who make deposits into the credit union. This credit union has $130 million in shares. The expense of these shares is $663,000 at a cost of 0.51%. The difference between interest income and interest expense is $6.3 million, and the net yield on the credit union's assets is 4.09%. In addition to covering dividends, net interest income must cover other expense items, like the provision for loan loss and non-interest expense. This is due to the fact that when we make loans, we must set aside a pool of funds to cover potential losses associated with credit risk. And like any business, we have normal operating expenses such as the cost of branches, salaries and benefits, insurance, and more. Fee income is a smaller source of revenue which can help offset operating expenses. After adding in fee income and subtracting expenses, the credit union's earnings were 1.3 million. 
This means the credit union earned a return on assets of 0.87%. For every $100 in total assets, the credit union is earning 87 cents. Because credit unions are member owned, capital or equity is generated through earnings. Regulatory guidelines for a well-capitalized credit union is a 7% net worth ratio. Net worth is the ratio of equity to assets. Our sample credit union has equity of 22 million with a net worth ratio of 14.4%. We learn from this sample balance sheet that there are several factors impacting how well the credit union performs. Net interest income is the major source of the credit union's net earnings and is impacted by the mix of assets and liabilities. A credit union with a higher concentration of loans will have higher interest income than a credit union with a higher concentration of investments. On the funding side of the balance sheet, the mix of shares impacts interest expense. Regular shares and share drafts generally have lower rates than certificate shares or money market accounts. The credit union is responsible for establishing loan rates and deposit rates, which are contributing factors to the level of interest income and interest expense. The level or volume of assets and liabilities affect net interest income. A larger credit union with higher levels of loans and shares can often operate at a lower margin than smaller credit unions. It's similar to Walmart. They can offer lower prices because they sell more items. Net interest income must cover the provision for loan losses and operating expenses. If a credit union has higher risk loans, they will have to set aside more in the provision for loan losses. How efficient the credit union is at managing overhead costs or operating expenses is also a factor in how well the credit union performs. The sources of fee income such as overdraft fees and credit card or debit card interchange fees can help offset these costs. Occasionally, the credit union may have non-operating income or expense. These are usually one-time events, such as the sale of an investment or fixed assets. In this section, we'll define asset liability management, determine its role in the operations of your credit union, see how it relates to financial performance, and define your role as a board member. While we often think of asset liability management as a regulatory or compliance exercise, Every time we make a loan to a member, open a share account for a member, or purchase an investment, we are engaging in asset liability management. It is the core of what we do as a credit union. It is a process of managing the assets and liabilities of the credit union to meet the credit union's specific financial objectives while balancing risk with reward. ALM is a process that is ongoing. It is not running a stack of reports to provide to the examiner at exam time. Managing is about evaluating the credit union's balance sheet, earnings and risk position, and making decisions based on that information. Each credit union has their own financial objectives. A credit union with low capital may have an objective to maximize earnings and control asset growth to build capital. Meanwhile, a credit union with strong capital may be focused on growth with a lesser concern on the level of earnings. In order to effectively manage the assets and liabilities, it's necessary to define the financial objectives of the credit union. Additionally, it requires that your credit union know its risk tolerance. This can be compared to your own personal retirement. You may have a goal to have a certain sum of money by the time you retire. You then select what types of investments you wish to hold in your retirement account, such as bonds, cash, and equities. In doing this, you also decide how much risk you want to take as that determines the types of investments you are willing to hold. As a credit union, you are also assuming risk. The objective is not to eliminate, but manage risk. The goals of ALM are to maintain positive earnings and protect capital. As we mentioned earlier, some credit unions may want to maximize earnings to build capital, while others with high levels of capital want only enough earnings to maintain capital levels. Whereas protecting the capital you've already earned provides a credit union with long-term viability to serve its members, we also want to maintain stable levels of earnings and capital. This allows a credit union to make loans and meet members' withdrawal requirements of share balances, so we must ensure that we have liquidity to meet these needs. Lastly, we manage risk and make decisions to balance the risk we take. We've discussed earlier in this session that the credit union's financial performance is driven by the mix of loans, investments in shares, the rate we set on loans, dividends paid on shares, and the types of products we offer. These are the asset liability decisions that your management team makes. These decisions are not made in a vacuum. Instead, they are influenced by member needs. We need to offer the types of loans and shares that our members need and want. How we price our products is influenced by competitor rates. Market interest rates also determine our pricing. 
the regulatory environment may impact the types of products and or investments or the concentration of types of products we can hold. The formalized process for asset liability management begins with an asset liability policy. The policy provides a framework of the objectives of the credit union, assigns responsibility, defines actions to measure and manage risk, and delineates the credit union's risk tolerance guidelines. In order for the credit union to manage risk, it must know how much risk it has. This is accomplished with asset liability models, which measure interest rate and liquidity risk. Credit unions have the option of purchasing a model and running it themselves or outsourcing the risk measurement to a third party. ALM does not stop with a risk measurement. Once the risk is known, the credit union must review the model reports to determine how the risk and the financial performance of the credit union is changing. Next, the credit union will make decisions to either reduce risk if it is too high or perhaps take on more risk if there is growth or earnings opportunities the credit union wishes to implement to better serve its members. Hopefully this helps you see that ALM is more than a regulatory exercise, but a process central to serving the credit union's membership. For your credit union to be successful, one of the keys is to have an active board and senior management oversight that understand the amount and type of risk the credit union has in their balance sheet. As discussed previously, the credit union must have a policy with risk limits and a system to identify and measure the risk. And with anything we do, we want to ensure that our process is working effectively through strong internal controls. As a board member, your responsibility is to oversee the ALM process. This includes performing each of these functions. You will approve the policy. Don't just rubber stamp it. Ask questions if you do not understand. ALM is a balance of technical expertise and common sense. While you may not be an ALM expert, you have the common sense. The policy is the primary tool for controlling interest rate risk. A board member should have a general understanding of the amounts and types of risk that the credit union holds. This is accomplished through exposure by formal ALM training and asking questions at board meetings. The board approves the risk limits recommended by management. A board member also assigns responsibilities to your management team or an asset liability management committee. Make sure your credit union has a policy, risk limits, and a model or some other method to measure risk based on the complexity of your balance sheet. You should monitor the risk the credit union takes based upon reports provided to you at board meetings. Depending upon the size of your credit union, management or an asset liability committee may have the responsibility to develop and implement policies or determine and recommend balance sheet plans and strategies. Determine what models or systems the credit union will use to identify and measure risk. Monitor the risk. Develop specific actions to control risk or implement balance sheet strategies. Communicate through reporting to the board. This concludes the introduction to asset liability management. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.